I'm Tia Borden with Mining IR, and beside me is Rick Rule, founder of Sprout USA. Now you've transitioned from, I guess, full-time involvement with Sprout, although you are still involved, um, into your own um, business, which is called Rural Investment Media. It's an investor education and media events business. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I'm still a director of Sprout. I'm still a larger shareholder. I contemplated retirement and met that with sort of a, a horrid sense. <laughs> and so I decided, I decided to go into the investor education and events business. What was the reason for that? Why education? Uh, I have been involved in guiding investors for almost 50 years. And there are some fairly common mistakes that I see investors making that I thought that I might have the ability to help correct. I also have been a beneficiary of various investment conferences over 30 or 40 years, began doing my own 30 years ago, and thought that I could do uh, some forms of investment events better than other people. Uh, so to find out, I decided to do it. And I'm sure you can with all the experience that you have in the industry. With that said, can you give us a bit of background on your um, your involvement in the industry and, and where you came from? Uh, I'm American. I was born in the United States in San Jose, California. But I came to Canada in 1970 to attend the University of British Columbia. To be completely frank, uh, I began a career in, quote, natural resource finance, meaning that I've done the same thing effectively ever since. I cut my teeth in resources here in Vancouver, but very quickly migrated back into the United States, which is a larger capital market, and also a capital market that's underserved in terms of resource issuers relative to Canada. So my career beginning in 1977 was primarily domiciled in the United States. I've been involved in most aspects of natural resources and all types of natural resources, mining, oil and gas, agriculture, timber, water, the whole gamut. It's been an absolutely wonderful career. Uh, and hopefully after 45 years, I've learned to do at least some things better than most people are able to do them. Well, you have a pretty diverse background. Now, tell us more about Rural Investment Media, what the events look like, and what type of education you're, you're doing. Rural Investment Media became, began as a service with no idea at all how I might monetize it. You know, I figured I'd worry about that when I grew up. And one of the things that I did, and still do, in fact, is that if you go to my website, ruralinvestmentmedia.com, any of your viewers can do this. If you enter the natural resource stocks that are in your portfolio, please no crypto, Please no pot stocks, please no tech, just resource stocks. I'll personally rank them one to 10. And I'll comment on individual issues that I, think, that I think might have value. I did this because most people own stocks according to narrative, according to story, rather than according to merit. And I hoped that by giving people information about something they were interested in, which was to say their own portfolio, that I could begin the process of educating them to be better investors. What I learned accidentally, I've now graded 80,000 portfolios in four years, is that there are some fairly common things that some investors get right and some fairly common things that investors get wrong. 80,000 people is a relatively good statistical sample. So it turns out that I've learned as much as I taught, which is very gratifying. And you did touch on some of the things that you're seeing investors do wrong, some of the challenges that they're facing. Can you expand on that a little bit more? The most common among speculators, among the kind of people that would be at the Vancouver Resources Investment Conference, is that they own too many stocks and they don't do enough work. It is not uncommon for someone to present a portfolio for me to me that has 50 stocks in it. I have advocated now for 30 years that the number of speculative stocks in your portfolio should correspond exactly to the number of hours per month you want to work understanding your investor investments. So if you're going to work 10 hours a month, you could own 10 stocks. And by uh, work, I don't mean watching generalist videos. I mean reading, policy, reading uh, proxy statements, annual reports, quarterly reports. And many people, as I say, own a, lo a laundry list of 50 stocks. When I occasionally correspond with those people, uh, you know, they'll say, well, let's go through the stocks. I say, okay. They'll start at A, Amalgamated Aardvark. You know, uh, why did you buy the stock? Well, Bob Bishop recommended it. Bob Bishop's been retired for 15 years. Why do you still own it? Well, I can't sell it. Why can't you sell it? 
I bought it for four dollars, it's at forty cents. If I sell it, I'll lose three dollars and sixty cents. And I need to say very gently, no, sir, you've already lost three dollars and sixty cents. The question is, what are you going to do with the remaining forty? If you think the stock is worth forty, why don't you buy some more? If you don't think it's worth forty, why don't you sell it? You follow where I'm going? I do. The I whole do. process, really, the evolution of rural investment media has come about as a consequence of studying 80,000 individual for portfolios over 40 years and beginning to segregate the mistakes and the successes and the reasons for both. Well, let's talk about the success then. What are you seeing investors do right? The investors who make money in resources are investors who understand that it's a cyclical business. They are investors who are contrarians. I would go far enough to say that if you're not a contrarian in this business, you're going to be a victim. People want to buy stocks where the narrative has been reinforced by price action, which is to say if the gold price is up by 100 percent, people are attracted by, to, to gold after it's moved. The price action validates the narrative. That's the way you lose money in resources. It's not the way you make money in resources. You make money in resources by buying things that are deeply out of favor. And when they return to favor, you sell them. Rick, what is the typical process for new investors? How do they go about getting involved and starting the process? Well, let's do two things, how they do get involved and how they should get involved. Those are very different stories. How they do get involved is they fall in love with a narrative. Maybe they're studying things online and they hear some old fat guy named Rick Rule talk about how he's concerned about the national debt how he's concerned about negative interest rates, how he's concerned about quantitative easing, and how as a consequence of that he's attracted to gold. Some part of that narrative rings a bell with them, and they adopt that narrative as their own. They act on it before they have invested enough in their education to understand how to implement the strategies that they're trying to implement. My friend Doug Casey describes the process as, got a hunch, bet a bunch. And it's fatal. You can't do that. You need to invest in yourself before you invest the money. You need to go to the Northern Miner if you're in the mining business and you need to buy a little book called Mining Explained. So at least you know what the words mean. Start with the basics. Yeah. <laughs> then you need to apply common sense. You need to look at the balance sheet. Do they have any money? Are they broke? Do they have enough money to be an ongoing concern? In other words, can they deliver exploration results as an example in 18 months or are they broke? How much money do they spend on general and administrative expense relative to how much money goes on the ground? This is very common sense stuff, but most people don't do it. There are four books that all of your listeners should read. Oh. I don't just mean buy. I like a good recommendation. I what mean are they? buy them and read them. Okay. The first one is Economics in One Lesson. It'll tell you how the economy really works rather than how the morons who taught economics in university taught you that it works very important book. And it's quick, it's short, it's easy to read. So Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. The second book, after you've read that one, uh, is a book called The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. I've heard of that one, haven't read it. Relative to the effort acquired to read it, it's the best investment book of all times because it's easy. <laughs> the third book, however, if you found Intelligent Investor interesting, is Securities Analysis, also by Ben Graham. It is not the easiest book you will ever read. It's a very dense book and it's a very hard book. But Tia, if you read that book and you apply the lessons, you will become rich. Well, I think, Rick, a lot of people are intimidated. It seems overwhelming and I think you need to simplify it, right? It is very odd that you say that. You're exactly right. People are intimidated by the process, but they're not intimidated to put $100,000 into a sector they don't understand. And I don't understand that at all. <laughs> uh, I'm much more intimidated to try to make money in a sector I don't understand. I'm not a tech investor. I don't even know what the words mean. Uh, I'm not a pot investor because I haven't done due diligence for 50 years. You know, I'm an old guy. Uh, I understand conventional financial services and mining. So I'm less in uh, intimidated doing stuff that I understand. That you know and you understand. Yes. So now I, I understand your comment, but I think that people need to readjust their orientation and be less intimidated by knowledge and more intimidated by uninformed action. And I think, again, starting with the basics and a couple of good books is a right. good way to, to segue into it. Now, tell us a little bit about the markets and what you're seeing currently. Mixed. Uh, I see a market that began to be chastened. 
that began to be cautious really is a consequence of rising interest rates. And by the way, I think that caution is very warranted. I'm playing a bit of defense myself. But I'm seeing a bit of a backing off from that. I'm seeing a market that has begun to be conditioned to higher interest rates uh, and is still seeking opportunity. My own viewpoint is that we have been through 40 very, very benign years in investing, beginning in 1981. The consequence of that, the consequence of declining interest rates, the consequence of inclusion in the workforce, the consequence of the good aspects of globalization, and in particular, the consequence of declining real interest rates, is that we've been through a time which is as generous as any time in human history. And people have become more confident in their abilities to invest and more confident in the market than I think they ought to be. So I would suggest that most people, uh, unless they understand a lot about what they're investing in, um, be cautious. People tell me, I, I'm highly liquid, I have a lot of cash. And people say, Rick, uh, your cash is costing you money. You're getting 3% in a savings product where inflation is costing you 7%. You're losing 4% a year. My response to that is yes, what you say is true. Losing 4% beats losing 14 or 15%. And in my experience, once every sort of 10 years, we have some form of panic. Mm -hmm. Having the cash will give you the tools and perhaps the courage to take advantage of that circumstance as opposed to being taken advantage of by that circumstance. Now, Rick, going into 20, well, we're, we're a little bit into 2023 already, but going into the remainder of the year, what are you hoping to see or what are you excited about? I think, first of all, that we are in the beginnings of the continuation of a precious metals bull market. I see the wind in the sails of precious metals. Precious metals do well when investors' confidence in conventional savings products fades. And everything that I see makes me less confident in conventional products. Negative real interest rates debt and deficits, the global weaponization of the U.S. dollar. Many of your listeners won't know, Tia, that the aggregate market share of precious metals and precious metals investments relative to other classes of investments in the United States are less than one half of 1%. The four decade mean is 2%. I'm not suggesting to you or your listeners that gold will supplant the U.S. dollar or U.S. Treasury securities. I'm suggesting that gold will lose less badly. If gold were merely to revert to mean in terms of market share, that is go from one half of 1% to 2%, demand for precious metals and precious metals related assets would quadruple. And that's what I think is gonna happen. Now our platform is primarily investor based. Right. What message would you like to get across to them before I let you go? Invest in yourself. Learn how to invest in companies. Do the work apply common sense. So many times investors have said to me, Rick, if the silver price goes up, what might that do to the shares of amalgamated aardvark silver? And I have to say very gently, sir, amalgamated aardvark silver doesn't have any silver. They're looking for silver. And if the price of something that you don't have any of goes up, it should have no impact on the value of the stock. Using common sense, understand that uh, a share of stock isn't a tick on a computer. It represents fractional ownership in a business. If you understand something about the delta between the value of the business and the price of the, exist, uh, of the business, you're on the way to making some money. If you don't, do something pleasant with the money. You know, buy a kid a present, take a trip to Las Vegas, whatever it is that you like to do, do that. Don't throw it away in the market. Right. Rick, thank you so much. It was a pleasure chatting with you, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Tia, thank you for your time and attention. Thanks so much.